Hi, I'm Lisa Ray, and welcome to my talk, Kotlin Beyond the Style Guide. It's probably the weirdest talk I've ever written, so thank you for coming. So when I pitched this talk, I decided I'd read a lot of books on great writing by great authors, and I'd apply those lessons to code. When I started learning Kotlin about a year and a half ago, um, almost two years, I, it was the first language I'd really learned since Java, and I felt really inspired by it, really full of creative inspiration. So I got, and that's how this talk came to me. Um, I got suggestions from my friends who work in journalism and who work in writing, and I read all of these books this summer. Um, so if you would like a book review, just come find me afterward. <laughs> Uh, but to be honest, I had read this Stephen King book a really long time ago, originally, and I didn't remember it that well. And I had assumed that in all of these books, there would be a little bit more focus on the basics of writing. So in the end, I found the two most useful works for me were actually two old-school classics of English language writing essentials, and I decided to focus on those two instead. So I hope you get as much of a kick out of them as I did. Why did I start with books on writing at all? After all, a novel is written in natural language. And in our case, in our case, we're using the example of English. Natural language has evolved organically as a way for human beings to communicate. It's often inconsistent, it's intentionally vague, and it really depends on context. And it only gets worse when you constrain it to the written form. If you don't believe me that natural language depends heavily on context, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this app. This app was called Yo. It was launched as a joke in 2014. And it transmits no information except the word Yo. So you can send yo's to all your friends. And along with that yo, it sends context. Who is sending it? My boss or my girlfriend? When are they sending it? Monday morning or Friday at 2 a.m.? What's going on today? Is there a football game? How many times did they send it? What did I say to them recently? That's context. And natural language is ambiguous. Take this example, which was just the first to occur to me. What do I mean when I say, take a bow? It could be, take a bow, we're at the opera. Or it could mean, take a bow. Take your bow and play the violin with the rest of the orchestra, you lazy musician. Or it could mean, take a bow, help us wrap the presents. So in the first 60 seconds of this talk, we've established that there are some problems with English if we're trying to be precise. And this is what George Orwell has to say about English. It becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. So our natural language is a reflection of us. It's a chicken and egg problem. Luckily, computers are creations of pure logic, and they don't have foolish thoughts. So if English sucks so much, why do we want to use it at all? Why not just use logical symbols? And the answer is, for our sake, because we have the net best natural language parser in the world in our brain. So we have to try and find a balance between the computer's language and our language. So for computers, we use a formal language, a language which is designed to be precise and unambiguous to the computer. For situations where natural language is unsuitable, like computer programming, now, with Kotlin, if it compiles, then it's clear to the computer. It may not do what you intended, but you've given the computer unambiguous instructions, and you can use testing to verify that it is the right result. Now, in the spectrum of programming languages, there's a huge amount of variety. It's easy for a program to be clear to a computer, but totally incomprehensible to developers. So this is clear to a computer but I have no idea what it's doing. A program can be clear to a computer, and it can be clear to the author when they write it, but still incomprehensible to others. 
So this is supposedly validating a phone number in regex. As we all know, there are problems with that. So of course, you can write any programming language this way. If you want to be incomprehensible, you can. But some of them seem like they're designed to encourage it. Or you could make a language that's actually clear to everyone, even if they don't know code. So this is a language called Inform7, which is designed for writing text adventure games. And it's actually a strict subset of natural language. Anyone can read this, but it's extremely verbose. In this language, you're literally writing a novel of code. If you didn't figure it out, uh, this is actually a retelling of the story of Cinderella. And it goes on for about the length of a book. So Kotlin falls in the middle. And it's not to say that programming languages take nothing from natural language, because actually, they take a lot. For starters, they take most of their source vocabulary from natural language. And of course, in the case of Kotlin, luckily for me, that's English. Some of it they redefine, like function becomes fun, and it has a totally different meaning. If they define it more narrowly, like open, if, else, some symbols are just added in, logical symbols. But then we, the developers, who are natural language speakers, supply the remaining parts, the names of methods, variables, and classes, and the large-scale structure and order by which we organize our code. So this talk is not as much a programming talk, because again, if your code compiles, you can communicate with your computer. And if you're here, I'm guessing that you already use Kotlin almost every day to communicate, which is what we call programming. This talk is more about how the Kotlin we write can help us communicate with other developers, how we can be more expressive and clear about our intentions while playing within the rules. So to do that, let's start with the official Kotlin style guide. If you've read the whole thing, you'll know that it's not long, but it's quite dense. It goes through the mechanics like white space, capitalization, punctuation, ordering, like the ordering of um, modifiers, the order in a file, naming, what's good and bad, and finally, a lot of really useful starting advice on idiomatic usage, immutability, uh, the when construct, defaults versus overloads, and on and on. Despite having read this before you started, if you did, I just jumped in. <laughs> Despite following all of these rules, you may have found that the first Kotlin code you wrote was fairly awful, and that no one in your team could agree about what was actually good. Uh, so we'll all start on the same page. We'll start with naming. And this is common along a lot of programming languages, and it's the basis of the taxonomy we'll talk about today. Um, so objects, straight from the style guide, objects are usually nouns, they're things, Methods are usually verbs, and those are actions. Uh, so there's a subtitle in the naming section called Choosing Good Names. So if you can have a good name, what's a bad name? And it goes on to say that the name should make it clear what the purpose of the entity is. So it's best to avoid using meaningless words like manager and wrapper in your names. Well, meaningless is a pretty strong word, don't you think? Who would intentionally put a meaningless word in their class name? Well, let me tell you, these words in Java aren't meaningless. They are the screaming of programmers, tortured souls, <laughs> when they're programming Java. Luckily, Kotlin lets us use functions as first-class citizens now. So we don't need wrappers and managers for our methods anymore. Next, let's get into the optional features in Kotlin. Kotlin's type inference, as we know, lets us leave out a lot of things. Sometimes it lets us leave out brackets. Um, we can leave out some return types and the types of some properties. So another popular admonition in writing is to cut out the extra. And our panel of writers completely agrees. If it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. And Strunk just says, omit needless words following his own advice. On the other hand, Android Studio is a little less opinionated. It's pretty opinionated about most of the style guide. If you type something, it will pop up these little helpful warnings. You should remove this. 
Uh, but if you write something like this, it doesn't pop up any autocorrect. It says you can leave in Boolean. If you write something like the bottom, it doesn't tell you to put it back in. So it seems, in the end, the decision is actually up to you. As I've been writing by myself and a team of one for the last year, I usually leave them out when I think they're obvious. And on the other hand, I put them back. If it's complicated, in my opinion, I put them back in. On the other hand, I saw a talk last year by uh, Maria Neumeyer at Deliveroo, who said that when her team was all learning Kotlin together as beginners, they all left their return types in because it really spared them confusion. And I think she's actually talking about a lot of that learning story later today. So you should go and see her talk. Next, let's dive in a little bit. An obvious target, if you're interested in natural language, are Kotlin's infix functions. These are class functions or extension functions which have just one parameter. So they are acting on exactly two objects. Um, there's a bunch of them built in, and so you can write things like this if you prefer, A and B, or hello world matches a regex. So the function name is between the receiver and the parameter, and this is a bit of an unusual syntax. And you can also write your own custom infix functions. For example, if we'd like to say the sentence, Lisa likes food. We can go from here, and we can set up a whole structure to do this. Say we can have some enums for interests that are possible. We can go on and make a data class for a person who has a list of interests. And initiate me, a person who likes food and wine. And then finally, we can make a function to say what a person likes. Pretty straightforward so far. Using all of these, we get lisa.likes food. So it's really close, but there's still a dot and two parentheses on our code. It's not rocket science translating this to and from English, but it is an additional mental step we have to do. So if we switch this up and we change our function to be an infix function, we can go ahead and say exactly like our original sentence, Lisa likes food, true. Lisa likes hiking, false. So this can look exactly like English. And at the risk of looking a little ridiculous, you can keep going defining your own infix functions. We could put another one, interest and interest, makes a list of interests. We could have person liking a list of interests, returning a Boolean. So you could say Lisa likes food and wine. It's tempting to think that you can just go wild with infix functions. You could write your whole program with infix functions. <laughs> But here's a couple of reasons not to. For starters, they all have the same precedence as each other. So you'd end up nesting a lot of parentheses. And at that point, your code reads like English, but it looks like Lisp. So what are you really gaining here? <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, English's verb cases mean this doesn't always read well, even if there's one subject and one object. Most functions are written in the imperative case, like Lisa, take out trash. Um, so this seems OK in traditional uh, syntax for a function, because we're used to seeing this. But when you write it as a sentence, it looks really weird. Lisa, take out trash. It's like something Tarzan would say. Or you can try, Lisa takes out trash. Is that an action, or is it an assertion? Like, every Monday, Lisa takes out the trash. We don't know. So you don't want to put these everywhere. I've found some of the simplest and best uses of infix functions are testing. Testing can be really tedious, and it can be really confusing. So it's especially valuable, I find, to have these dead simple, naturally expressive assertions. And you don't have to know anything about programming to understand these tests. You just have to speak English. Uh, I've seen a few libraries that have used this especially effectively uh, with Marquito. All right. So let's get a little bit crazy. We'll talk about the passive voice, which is a construction in English that is a major punching bag for writing teachers and anyone who writes about how to write. So the active tense is something really straightforward, like Bob throws the ball. And the passive tense is when you reverse it and you say, the ball was thrown by Bob. 
If we ask our sages of writing, they all have strong opinions on passive voice. And I even snuck a bit from Stephen King in here. He says, you should avoid the passive tense. Strunk says you should use the active voice, and Orwell says never use the passive where you can use the active. So, unanimous. And because of Kotlin's syntax, um, which is much more strict than English, we don't really have problems with the passive voice exactly, but it's significant to us because of what it allows. You can omit the subject. You see this a lot in formal writing. Instead of, I performed the experiment, or my team performed the experiment, you hear, the experiment was performed. And it can lead to whoppers like, I would have finished my homework, but my data was deleted. Yeah, OK, by whom? Uh, so this is an omission of information. And from here, we come to something which is closely related. And I read an article in The Economist about this recently. They called it either the evasive voice or the weasel voice, which I particularly like. It's often confused with passive voice, but it's a bit different. So I'll give you an example headline here. Darth Vader dies on Death Star. And this headline modeled in Kotlin. We need an enum for alive and dead. We have a person again who starts by default in the alive state. A person. Vader, and at some point, his state turns to dead. But we all know this isn't a good headline, because what did he die of? Old age? So a better headline would be something like, Darth Vader killed by Emperor Palpatine, uh, passive voice, or Emperor Palpatine kills Darth Vader. And if we simplify this even more to uh, Vader dies, or Palpatine kills Vader, we can notice that we didn't use the verb kill in the original headline. We used the verb die, which is intransitive, which means it doesn't have a subject. To put it another way, a transitive verb has a subject and an object, and an intransitive verb only has one. So we can't do, for example, Palpatine dies Vader. So this actually has nothing to do with the passive voice. It's another sneaky grammar trick. It's the choice of an intransitive verb, which transmits less information. Or in the case of our code, an enum, which doesn't capture all of the information we need. In other language, we might have to sacrifice the simplicity of this enum to get more information. But we can actually use Kotlin's sealed classes to convey more information while preserving and enforcing that simplicity. So by making this state a sealed class, we can keep these two states alive and dead, but dead will now have to have a cause. And we can use another sealed class for causes. Sorry, this is getting a bit grim. So you could have a natural death, for example, you could have an accident, or you could be killed by, say, a Sith Lord. So for example, if you die peacefully, the state would be dead of natural death, from old age. Great, that's what we want. So now we've continued to enforce the simplicity of only two states for a person, alive or dead, which means we can continue to write code like this. Because there are still only two states, this is an exhaustive one. But we, and all users of our code, can no longer do this. Vader dies. Well, there's been no value passed for parameter cause. Thank you. Instead, it looks like this. Vader's state is now dead, killed by Palpatine. So this is the best of both worlds. We use the sealed classes to require specific information while still restricting the information space. I was inspired to talk about sealed classes by a talk by Christina Lee. So if you like this section, she gave a talk here yesterday. And I think there's another talk on sealed classes today by Patrick Cousins, so check that out. Now let's talk about scope functions. These were one of the first parts that was a little difficult for me to wrap my head around. I quickly fell in love with them, and then I overused them. I like to think of them as the conjunctions of Kotlin. And Strunk has something to say about conjunctions. He says, a common way to fall into wordiness is to present a simple, complex idea in a series of sentences that might 
to advantage be combined into one. So he's saying by combining many repetitive sentences or statements, we can form single, shorter, better sentences. So you can look at an example like, I'm going to the store now. The store gets busy after work. Versus the two of them combine, I'm going to the store because it gets busy after work. The second sentence is obviously better, it's shorter, it's less repetition, and it joins two related ideas. I'll spare you the sentence diagrams, but you can also see the second phrase, it gets busy after work, is now attached to and describing the store. And we can do this in all kinds of ways, like this example. I'm going to the store, the store is probably busy right now, but I'm out of ice cream, emergency. Um, so in the second version, you see I'm going to the store, which is probably busy now, but I'm out of ice cream. So there's no it anymore. Is probably busy now is said in the context of the store. It's kind of like a lambda with receiver. Too far? OK. We'll jump into code. The point is that scope functions are not just syntactic sugar or help to make your code shorter. They actually help you state what you're doing more expressively. So in this example, something like all of an ice cream with sprinkles turns into ice cream, apply, add sprinkles. I'll have an ice cream, and I need a receipt. Ice cream also, print receipt. So these are compound sentences in English, and then in code. Now, what about this one? We could combine both statements in the same function, but now we're mixing up configuration and side effects. Luckily, if we go back to the original style guide, it actually says, don't do this. If we're calling methods on multiple objects in the same block, for starters, we should use a function that provides the context object as it. On the other hand, we could switch to using also, and it still wouldn't quite make sense, because adding sprinkles is not a side effect. It's still configuration. So in this case, even though it's slightly longer, I prefer the option of chaining them, because it's so clear about it, what it's doing. And this makes more sense when you have a lot more things in each function. This turns out just like our original sentence. I'll have an ice cream with sprinkles, and also I need a receipt. The problem is, as this gets even a little bit more complex, it's pretty confusing to read. In this case, if they still have ice cream, get me one with sprinkles and a receipt. All we've added is that now our ice cream is nullable. So there could be ice cream, or there could be no ice cream. So if there's no ice cream, are we going to get a receipt or not? And the answer is, you'll get a receipt for a null ice cream. <laughs> That's right, the context object in your function can be nullable. So if print receipt requires a non-null object, the IDE will warn you. But if it's a platform type, you're not going to know until your code crashes. So if we insert one more safe call, then we'll only get the receipt if there's ice cream. But I'm not sure that one single question mark is making this abundantly clear to myself and anyone else I work with. So it's easy to see how chaining functions from take us from making a lot of sense to actually complicating the situation. Maybe it's time to fall back to if or else. And having told us to use conjunctions to make things simpler, Mr. Strunk then warns us about going overboard. He says, avoid a succession of loose sentences. And he's referring especially to compound sentences. An unskilled writer will sometimes construct a whole paragraph of sentences of this kind. Ouch. <laughs> so they're good until they become too much. And I do find that when people start writing Kotlin, they often feel compelled to use every one of the scope functions somewhere. So what else can we do apart from chaining these functions? Luckily, we have a few other tools up our sleeves. Our formal language also has tools that English doesn't. So for starters, we can also often shift configuration right into an object's constructor. Now, what you can do here is pretty limited. But if you control this class, then careful manipulation of constructor parameters can go a long way. So here we have one varag parameter for toppings, which comes first. And then next, we have a named parameter for the flavor, 
which comes after. And finally, we have a lambda outside parentheses last for our special logging function. Now, if we put them in any other order, this trick wouldn't work anymore. If all else fails, you can go on and consider making your own custom DSL. DSL standing for domain-specific language. And it allows you to define your own specialized interface, much in the way functions like apply and also work within Kotlin. Now, coming from Java, the first time I saw one of these, my head almost exploded. It was like a new language made out of, entirely out of curly braces. Now, each one of these expressions is a lambda with receiver, where the receiver is actually a custom builder class, and then the next most inner expressions are its methods. And I don't have time to give a full exp explanation of how DSLs work in Kotlin, um, but I think there were two talks on them yesterday, and there's another one this afternoon. So have a look at those. And there's also a number of excellent talks on YouTube and directly from the JetBrains folks. So the next answer is, can you have too many custom DSLs? Uh, this is one of the only times you'll hear me use boilerplate and Kotlin in the same sentence. So I love using well-crafted DSLs, but I hate writing them. I find them really tedious. They add boilerplate and lots of maintenance overhead to your own code. So my, old, my own golden rule is never to use a DSL where named parameters will do. The second question is, can you pollute your code base by using Kotlin DSLs provided by other libraries? And my answer to this is, I don't think so, not really. After all, um, as long as those DSLs are thoughtfully written, again, anyone can write bad code if they really want. Um, custom DSLs in Kotlin are still internal DSLs. We're not creating an independent syntax. We're not making a new formal language. We're reusing the syntax of Kotlin and just setting up a structured way to use Kotlin's existing co syntax. Phew. So it looks like I've really run through this quite quickly. But the moral of the story is that beyond the style guide, the functionality in Kotlin gives you lots of cho new choices and new paradigms. And in the end, it's up to you to choose how to use or abuse them. Writing advice may or may not be helpful for you, but either way, I hope it's made you think a bit. So thank you.